Good evening. And first at five, the federal government has cut back food benefits for low-income families nationwide, bringing an end to extra help it provided during the pandemic. Now many, including those in Oregon and Southwest Washington, are trying to figure out how to make up the difference. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko. And I'm Laurel Porter. The added SNAP money ended today. Tim Gordon takes us to a food bank in Vancouver that expects to feel the effects. Well, this food bank in downtown Vancouver is a busy place. People line up all day to get food for themselves and their families. And with that increased SNAP benefit expiring now, Fish expects to get even busier. Whenever this food bank is open, it draws a crowd of people lined up looking to make ends meet. My family and I, we work, but there's still a struggle um, to get everything we need. So it's great to have this kind of places. Places like Vancouver's Fish have been increasingly busy through a pandemic and continued tough economic times. The federal government increased SNAP food benefits for low-income families during the pandemic, and the prospect of that ending has been looming. Now that it's actually happened, we're a little bit worried. That's James Fitzgerald, executive director of Fish. He says the demand for the nutrition they have to offer has more than doubled in less than a year. To go from you know, 60 families to 120 or, or more families per day coming through here, um, I mean, it puts a strain on staff, it puts a strain on the amount of food that we uh, have to give. But they vow to do all they can to keep up. Being out in the cold like the I look. Right place is the right time. Right time. For people like Dorothy and Jerry, friends in line today, and quite understanding of the loss of added SNAP benefits. And and it went on enough for us to be able to, to survive Five. everything that's right. happened. And I think it's it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. We just need to be appreciative of, of the people who allow this yeah. stuff to happen. To happen. That said, for many people who come here, losing roughly $90 per person per month of SNAP money is a big hit for any household. With food prices gone up and, and uh, gas prices and all that thing, and all this coming together at once, it's like it couldn't be a bigger storm happening with, with that also going away for people. So we, we are very concerned about what that means for, for families. So FISH stands for Friends in Service to Humanity. They've been in the Vancouver area for more than 50 years and are very grateful for the community support. But they're always looking for more in terms of financial help and volunteers. It takes a lot of people to run this place. If you want to get involved, look to our story at KGW.com for more information. In Vancouver, Tim Gordon, KGW News. Developing tonight, thawing out from our recent winter weather continues to be a challenge in some parts of town. A KGW viewer sent us these photos today showing the road by Northwest Greenleaf and Skyline. Look at that. They said things are pretty slippery due to last night's freeze. This is one of the highest elevation areas in the West Hills. A plow did go up there today to clear out the road. And our cold stretch is continuing with low temperatures around or below freezing and maybe, dare I say, <laughs> some more snow. Meteorologist Joe Ranieri is checking that out for us in our first forecast, Joe. Well, before everyone's jaw hits the ground like yours, Laurel, that uh, rain and snow mix threat will be in the high elevations, 500 feet and higher. And if you're around 1,500 feet, that's where most of the advisories are going to be in place tonight and into tomorrow. But speaking to those cold temperatures that we woke up to, uh, definitely a hard freeze in many spots, down to the low 20s. 20s in a few spots, so no big surprise that whatever is still on the ground from last week's snowstorm and of course from the last couple of days, it's going to take a little bit to melt. This is what we saw in Portland, 32 degrees, but you get away from the city, you saw temperatures right around the low 20s. Heading into your overnight hours tonight, things will be a little bit uh, warmer, but we are tracking another round of some rain and snow as that front moves on shore. It's also going to be bringing some breezy conditions at times, so we bring in future cast. Here we are Thursday morning. We're going to be seeing most of the heavier snow showers over the higher elevations. We're talking about the foothills of the Southwest Washington Cascades and into the Oregon Cascades. But again, if you travel over the coast range, you could be seeing a couple of inches late tonight, inches of new snow late tonight and into tomorrow. But as we go into the afternoon hours tomorrow, we'll still see some spotty showers throughout the valley. And over the next couple of days, there could be a little bit of some cold air in place where you could be looking at a few snowflakes, you know, in the air. It kind of might look pretty for a little bit, but it's not going to be impacting us here down to the valley floor. As we look at the radar right now, all all is quiet, but late tonight and into tomorrow, we'll have a little more colors to talk about that. I'll talk more about your uh, long range models too and what you can expect to see you heading into the first week of March coming up in a few minutes.
All right, thank you, Joe. Let's get to our homeless crisis tonight. We are learning more about a proposal in Oregon that would give $1,000 payments every month to certain people, including some experiencing homelessness. And while the bill is only in its early stages, you can imagine it's already getting a lot of attention. Our Blair Best took a closer look at some of the details. Senate Bill 603 was all the talk on this corner of Old Town Wednesday morning. I actually think it's actually a very good idea. I really do. It's ideal to have food, water, shelter, be able to get a full job. The bill in question, the People's Housing Assistance Fund Demonstration Program, where for two years, monthly $1,000 payments would go out to people living on the streets, those at risk of becoming homeless, those who make less than 60% of the area median income, or spend more than half their monthly income on rent. It's a glimpse of hope for people like Elena Archer. That would actually dramatically help because then we'd actually be able to get a place. A group at Portland State University will be doing research on the project. Now we ask them, will this money be handed out as cash or vouchers? How will it be tracked? How will someone living on the streets with little resources get access to it? They tell us since it's so early on in the process, I mean, there's only been one hearing on the bill so far, that those details haven't been worked out yet. The old me would have said no way, you know, it's BS. Longtime Portlanders who are fed up with the local government's response to this crisis are cautiously optimistic. I don't see the need for another levy or tax to impose upon ourselves. Um, I think the that it's the money's there. They just got to control how, you know, monitor how it's spent and how it's, you know, that it's really helping people. They talk about it, but putting it in action is another thing. Well, as you just saw, not too many people are confident about this bill, but it's still in the early stages. It has to go through the Senate and the House and the governor has to sign off on it. So if it passes, it'll go into effect in January 2024. Now, the legislature is talking about using $25 million and enrollment for this program will be capped once all the money runs out. Blair Best, KGW News. We will definitely keep you posted. Also on homelessness tonight, a contentious exchange forced Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler to pause today's city council meeting and then move it online. That happened after some people who signed up to address council used their time to criticize a recent ban on distributing tents and tarps. Take a listen. To give some context as to why I'm here to address Ray, Renee Gonzalez's ban on the distribution of tents and sleeping bags via street response and the fire department, you guys, I operate you within guys, a framework of mutual aid for folks please. who don't know what that is. Mutual aid is a voluntary reciprocal exchange of resources. This, this is extremely disrespectful to the Police Accountability Commission that have this floor right now to discuss their item. You're not talking about that. So either get on topic or we're going to ask you to leave. All right, that speaker then yelled an expletive at the mayor and left. The mayor called for a short recess, continuing the meeting virtually. Here's why he said this. The tent ban was not on the council agenda, with council hearing testimony, as you heard, about police accountability. Last month, City Commissioner Renee Gonzalez banned some city groups from handing out tents or tarps to people who are homeless. At the time, Gonzalez cited concerns over recent fires at some of the camps. Unfortunately, stolen cars are nothing new in Portland. Over the past few years, we've seen a record number of cases. So to tackle this problem, the Portland Police Bureau is teaming up with an unlikely partner, cancer doctors. Investigative reporter Kylie Bosu joins us now in the newsroom to explain this is an unexpected partnership, Kyle. And Laurel, the relationship here is data. Portland Police is using data science Really in the same way sports teams use analytics or companies optimize performance. Now, East Precinct officers have started tracking elements that are present on every stop of a stolen vehicle. In all, nearly 100 factors are put into a database and analyzed. These include physical characteristics of the vehicle and vehicle driving behavior, and importantly, nothing about the driver's racial profile. These elements are called enrichment factors. Essentially, enrichment factors are the hallmarks of a stolen vehicle. For example, a missing license plate, broken window, no lights, or abnormal lane changes. As the theory goes, the more enrichment factors, the more likely it's a stolen car, which in practice seems to make sense. So when we look at a vehicle like this, you look at the fact that there's no plates on the vehicle, you look at the fact that there's a trip permit that may, may not come back to this vehicle. Um, their driving was uh, erratic, it was inappropriate, so that's also another that factor that um, made them realize it. And then when they tried to initiate a traffic stop on it, it ran, it eluded. Right. And so 
stolen car. And, and it all also, kind of adds up. Correct, correct. And then the driver also has a warrant for his arrest. And here's where the cancer doctors come in. Portland police asked researchers at OHSU Knight Cancer Institute to help because they specialize in large data sets. And so far, this new strategy appears to be working. Coming up at 6, we'll have the complete story. Again, how police and cancer doctors are working together to help break the cycle of stolen vehicles. Certainly hope you'll join us on the story at 6 o'clock for that story. Looking forward to it.